Okay, so let's have a look at the first question here. I've always been typed out. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. My objective in meditating is to obtain peace of mind. Is it all right for me to meditate without having a teacher, nor having any having attended any prime meditation class, but by merely learning and obtaining guidance from books and on YouTube, from whom I re from whom I reckon to be eminent, reputable, and reliable in meditation, namely you, Ajahn Brahm, and Mingyo Rinpoche, and yes, I feel comfortable confident and comfortable in doing so, at least, that's, at least thus far, after a few months of doing so. Thank you very much, Ajahn Brahm, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Yes, that is fine. You know, it's very hard to find teachers. Many people put themselves forward as being teachers, but it's nice to know some people who are reliable. For those of you who are here in Penang, there's also... Venerable Kai Si, very humble. He's been following my retreats for I don't know how many years, and this year he's coming to teach a meditation retreat in Perth. We would not let him do that if we didn't uh, uh, have confidence in him. And just to let you know, Ajahn Brahman Theravada, Mingyur Rinpoche, Swatriyana, where we spent last weekend. Uh, teaching together over in Singapore. So we know each other very well and we trust each other very well. So that is fine if you want to try for YouTube and if ever there is any very uh, big difficulty then you can always wait till you know one of us comes close by. It may not be to Penang but it could be to Kuala Lumpur or to Singapore or somewhere in the region and then you can catch us there and just ask any deep deep problems. And it's nice being able to talk about problems and things like nimittas or jhanas instead of just the ordinary problems of how to deal with a husband who doesn't let you meditate or how to how can you meditate when you've got a kid who's always wants your attention. Those are like ordinary problems. They are important to you but it's great to you know, use monks or nuns who have very good uh, abilities in meditation to ask them those sorts of questions whose answers you can't get from anywhere else. And those are the things I like the best. When people start asking me questions about nimittas or jhanas, so then you really sort of uh, uh, lift up. Because you know these are very important questions the person's actually practicing this meditation properly, they're getting to at least those stages. Anyway, the next question. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. How to handle a narcissist? Thank you. And our narcissists, remember the narcissists who thought they were so beautiful, so great, that, what was it, they looked in the, in the mirror or something and they turned to stone, I don't know what it was. But anyway, uh, this is a psychological character. I don't, sometimes the people think that these psychological character, um, characters or names of types of characters are always valid. I get into trouble with psychologists because I challenge this. Is there such a thing as a narcissist? There's always a narcissist. And my idea is no. There's more to them than that. Even I remember having arguments with psychologists. Is there something called a psychopath? Or are they more than that? And my understanding of the nature of the mind is you're always much more than any of these labels which people put on you. And if you are with somebody who you uh, see as a narcissist to exhibit character traits of narcissism or even psychopath or whatever. Obviously be careful, but you'll see something else in them which is also very wonderful in them. And if you can see the other side of them 
and cultivate that, let them know that, then a lot of times you change them from being one of these quite antisocial, troublesome, psychological types into something which is much more beautiful. And I say that because many years ago I gave a teaching in a conference in uh, the Woodlands Mental Health um, Units over in Singapore. They were aiming, you know what Singapore was like, aiming to make themselves a hub for mental health problems in Southeast Asia or, so, or this part of the world. I don't know why they keep calling it a hub. It'd be nice if they created a Buddhist hub. <laughs> but anyhow, that they, uh, I, start, I gave my talk on my ideas of like mental illness and these character traits of like being a psychopath or attention deficit disorder or a depressive. And what I understood, what I've seen over so many years is that these aren't permanent. These are people who exhibit those character traits, but there's much more to them than just those character traits which people can very simply uh, label as, say, schizophrenia. And when I said things like that, after my talk, this uh, gentleman came and he put his hands up in reference to me, but I noticed a big cross on his chest which he was wearing. I said, why did you uh, pay respects to me like that? You must be a Christian. He said, yes, I'm a very strict Roman Catholic. But I liked what you said. And I want you to come to my schizophrenia unit to give it a blessing. I said, does your bishop know about this? <laughs> <laughs> and he was laughing. He said, why do you ask me, a Buddhist monk, to come and bless your unit? because he was a professor of schizophrenia, the head honcho over in Singapore. He said, because what you taught, I thoroughly agree with. And that made me very interested. And I asked him, how do you deal with schizophrenia and schizophrenics in Singapore? How do you treat them? And he answered very brilliantly, I don't treat schizophrenics in the schizophrenia unit in Singapore. I treat the other part of them, which does not exhibit schizophrenia. And it was my turn to put my hands up to him and say, wow, well done. And I couldn't help but ask, what are the results? And he said, much better than conventional treatment. He saw in those young men and women, they had much more than you know, what many people feel when they're diagnosed with schizophrenia. There were many times they didn't exhibit schizophrenia at all. And that's what he focused on and encouraged and made grow stronger and stronger. So even narcissism, that's one way a person may uh, relate to others in the world. Well, there's much more to them than that. And if you can sort of notice the other good side of them, that can be encouraged. And they can literally grow out of that uh, characteristic of narcissism. And I love it when you don't put a people in a jail for life by um, diagnosing them as one of these mental illnesses. Because all these traits are temporary. They may last for many years. They do not last forever. And there was one lady, a good example of this. This was several years ago, maybe 30 years ago in Australia. She started coming to our Buddhist temple in Perth and she wasn't even a Buddhist. She came there because she felt it was a safe place. At that time, 
her husband was abusing her, beating her, hitting her. And at least she said for two hours coming into the Buddhist temple, her husband wouldn't go there. It was two hours of safety for her. That was the main reason why she started coming. But while she was there, she started hearing teaching such as this. You know, your husband may be violent, may be a dom giving you domestic abuse, but there's much more to him than that. And see if you can see some of the other traits in him and encourage those. And this little hero, this lady, she said it took her seven years. And what happened was she came to see me and she said, I want to thank all the people who have taught in this uh, institution, or not institution, this temple, and I've shown you this, uh, this Zen stall. Have you seen those Zen stalls, like three pieces of wood at an angle? They're really comfortable to sit on. I'm actually surprised I haven't seen many of those here in Penang. But they certainly use them in Australia a lot, and in Singapore. And I think in Kuala Lumpur as well. They're really comfortable. But anyhow, he said he made this for me as a surprise gift this morning for me to use at the temple. And she half joked, if he'd have given me any piece of wood five years ago, it would be to hit me with. He was very violent and a very bad husband. But now she said he's so soft and kind. And she brought him to our monastery and I saw him talk to him. He couldn't believe the changes in him. Because what she had done, every time he got violent, she tried to you know, hide so she didn't get um, hurt. But every time he did a good act, a kind act, the sort of act that you know a human being should perform, she grabbed him and gave him lots of kisses and hugs. She gave positive reinforcement to the positive behavior and ignored the negative behavior. And that's how he changed, she changed him. That's not recommended because that's very dangerous. She was lucky to be able to survive. But nevertheless, it was inspired me. That's what can be done. You may have a narcissist, you may have a schizophrenic, you may have, I don't know who. But then if you uh, reinforce a positive behavior in them, and find out what they like, then you find that you can change them. It takes a long time, but it can be done. Do you like to be loved? and respected, everybody does. And if you can find you know, how to use that as kind of leverage to let them change their behavior, it can be done. Another example of that, there was this gentleman, he migrated to Perth from Malacca, and his son was at university but his son preferred just playing around with his friends and his girlfriend rather than completing all his assignments for the university. And the mother and father got letters They're from the tutors. Your son is doing terribly. He may not be able to come back to university next year. He's got to do more work. And mother and father told him off. But that didn't make any difference to him. He was still spending more time with his girlfriend than uh, with his books. So his father was really smart. He was actually a, he was a lawyer. And so he, one evening, he waited for his son to come back from some party. And he came back in the car with his girlfriend he was waiting for them. And he invited them both in. Oh, please come inside. It'd be nice to have a chat with you both. And his son was really, really scared, rightly so. But the girlfriend said, oh, she's your dad. Let's go and have a chat. So they went inside the house. It was late at night. 
and the father was just speaking to the girlfriend. He said, I've seen you've been going out for quite a while now. I don't know what your relationship is, but it might one day get serious. You may think of even getting married. I don't know. But I just thought I'd let you know, you know the girlfriend, that my son is not doing any work at university and he's afraid of getting, getting kicked out from university. He's not completing his assignments. And then the girlfriend said, is that true? Are you not doing, doing your assignments? And embarrassingly, the son said, no. And anyway, I thought I'd just let you know that. I'm going to bed now, said the father. And the father went to bed. And from that day on, the girlfriend was on the back of her boyfriend, this guy's son, every week, have you finished your assignment yet? What grade did you get? Have you finished that work? Have you submitted it? Because boys of that age will not listen to their parents. But my goodness, they listen to their girlfriends. <laughs> they got full power over them. So if you have a boy like that who's not doing well at school or university, find a girlfriend for him. <laughs> and then you have full power over him. <laughs> you can turn him into something good. He actually passed in the end, which was good. Anyway, that's one question. And the next question. Another typed question, quickly. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. Good evening. In one of my meditation, I was exceptionally calm and saw a static dark circular ring. As I continued observing, it began rotating slowly and then rapidly resembling a whirlpool that felt like it was pulling me in. I panicked and opened my eyes. What can I do in similar situations in the future? Why am I encountering these frightening occurrences when meditation is supposed to promote calm and peace? It does promote calm and peace. This is not frightening. You are interpreting, perceiving it as frightening. If I saw like a whirlpool that was pulling me in, I would go for it. I would let it pull me in. Because usually when you get pulled in to those lights, you see an even more beautiful light and much more happiness and joy. Let it happen. There's no harm can be done. It's only when we don't understand what's going on, when we're afraid, that's when we don't like to be free. You know that when a person's been in prison for many, many years, and they find out that their prison sentence is almost ended, they're about to be released, how do they feel? They feel scared. Even though being free of prison is a wonderful freedom, but because they've got used to being in jail, they're afraid of freedom. It's the same as if you get pulled into a, into a circular ring. You feel it gets pulled in because you've never been in there before. You think, oh my goodness, what is this? You have nothing to fear. Allow yourself to go in and see what happens. We experience much peace and joy and happiness. Of course, dark circular rings, a lot of times they get much brighter and more beautiful. Not dark, but brilliant. The fact it's dark means you haven't got as much energy in your mindfulness as you possibly could have. It's why also I talked yesterday about developing that very powerful mindfulness, where you can have your lunch and just one, just one spoon or one morsel of rice with some sort of curry on it is absolutely delicious, like you've never tasted before. Your mindfulness has got really strong and whatever you see or taste is beautiful, is wonderful. That means your mind is starting to perceive energetic beauty. And when you start to do that, 
if you see these lights in the mind, they are also incredibly gorgeous. Most beautiful lights you've ever seen. And I mention that because if you do see this one fellow, I remember who saw this black circle, it wasn't um, rotating, but I said, well, that's a bit strange. I've never seen a black nimmer to myself, ever. But then he continued on and said, it wasn't like an ordinary black. It was more black than I've ever seen in my life. It was gorgeous, black, deep satin black, more black than coal. It was really rich and gorgeous. And then I said, okay, great. That's a limiter. I was wrong. Keep on going. It's his beauty. It's uh, delight it gives you to see. That's important. So if you saw a, a, a ring, a dark circular ring, if it was beautiful, then that would be a very good sign. After a while you can see that any color, doesn't matter what, it's the most beautiful blue you've ever seen in your whole life. And then it moves because your mind is moving. Now this is a teaching for those of you who start to get these things called nimitas and you want to develop them. When they are moving, that is an obstacle. And I recall, as a middle-aged monk, I recall this when I was in Serpentine. One morning, like basically every morning, I was shaving my chin. You know, as a Westerner, we get much more hair on our chin. And I have to shave it because that's considered in the West you know, to, be, um, to be clean and uh, to be you know, properly presented. And of course, many people look at me because I'm a senior monk. And as I was shaving my face, I noticed the image in the mirror was moving. My face was moving. And I don't know why I did this, but I did this just to prove a point. I held the mirror still, but the image in the mirror was also moving. That was because I was moving. The water was moving. And then I stopped moving. And my face was perfectly still, and the image in the mirror became still. And that was just proving a point. My nimitta moved, because I, the watcher, was also moving. When I became still, the image, the nimitta became still. So if your nimitta is moving, it's because you, the observer, is moving. You become still, and the nimitta becomes still. Trying to hold a nimitta still, this makes it move even more. You, the one watching, freeze. Don't move at all. You find the nimitta stops moving. I don't know if you can understand that, but to me that was one of the key experiences. It's very simple, but it works. And then these things aren't frightening or peace or disturbing. They're incredibly joyful, reassuring, peaceful. And that's not saying that to you, it's that's how you experience it. You love those experiences. And they're just so powerful. Dear Ajahn, can you share the difference of Anapana and Vipassana meditation? That's a very simple question. Now if you look, what is Vipassana meditation anyway? What people say Vipassana meditation is, they quote the Satipatthana Sutta. If you look at the Satipatthana Sutta, one of the first parts of the Satipatthana Sutta, the Kayanusati, the awareness of the body, and they say the way to fulfill the anapanasati through the body awareness is to watch your breathing. Anapanasati is part of vipassana meditation. And I can't understand why that's there in the anapanasati sutta. This is how to, to uh, 
become enlightened. It's part of the Satipatthana Sutta, sorry. That you do Anapanasati. And the Buddha said, anybody who does um, Anapanasati fulfills Satipatthana. It's one and the same practice. If you don't understand that, because you don't have too much knowledge of the suttas, then you can use this simile. Once upon a time, there were these uh, man and woman, he was called Sam, and his partner was called Vi. Sam, his surname was Atta. Sam Atta and his partner was Vi, was Vi Pasana. And they lived together, Sam and Vi. And one day, Sam and Vi decided they wanted to go on a walk up Meditation Mountain. Sam wanted to go up Meditation Mountain because it was so still and peaceful up there. Everything kind of stopped up the top. Vi, she was a photographer. So she just got a new you know, high-tech Canon camera, not one of these um, uh, iPhone cameras, but just a real professional one. So she wanted to go up Meditation Mountain to get some really amazing shots because up there you could see forever. But they also had uh, two dogs. The first dog was called Meta. And they always needed to take Meta for a walk. The second dog was called Anapana. So those two dogs, they took them up Meditation Mountain. And the higher they got up Meditation Mountain, the more peaceful it was. Oh, Sam really enjoyed the joy of peace. Peace, stillness, it's joyful, it's not scary. So he was enjoying every moment of the peace, even halfway up Meditation Mountain. And as for Vi, she was taking these amazing photographs, even halfway up, you could see so far and so clearly. As for Meta, Met, you know what a dog is like when they get really happy? They whack their tail like it's going to fall off. And they go running around in circles. Meta the dog was so happy, even halfway up Meditation Mountain. And as for the second dog, Anapana, Anapana was almost disappearing. She was like fading away. But when they got to the top, of Meditation Mountain, Anapana could not be found. Because in deep meditation, your breath vanishes. As for Metta the dog on the top of Meditation Mountain, oh she, was, oh, she was incredibly happy. The tail was wagging, 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 wagging. She couldn't stop it. And you could see the way she was running around. She was so full of joy. But every now and again, even Meta the dog stopped to look because the view, the insights on top of Meditation Mountain were amazing. And the peace. Sometimes Meta the dog, she stopped wagging her tail and just drank in the peace, which was very powerful. Sam, he was enjoying the peace up on Meditation Mountain, but he had a pair of eyes. So he could look at the amazing view as well. And he also enjoyed the bliss, the joy, the loving kindness on top of Meditation Mountain. And Vi, she was taking these amazing shots. The insights were, were enlightening. But she could also experience a deep peace there. So when she pressed the shutter button, she did it so quietly. It could hardly disturb the peace. The peace was fantastic. But also, she could enjoy the great love on top of Meditation Mountain. And the meaning of that simile is that med metta, kindness, compassion, insight, and stillness all go together. You can't have one without the other. That's the way people try to separate vipassana, samatha, and metta. You can't. 
they always go together. I'm going to tell another story because this is an important question. I always spend much more time on the first questions than the last questions because I've run out of time. But I said this to somebody during the interviews. It's actually how to get into deep meditation, how to get enlightened. It's a story of the <coughs> of the donkey and the carrot. That's how I usually explain it in Australia, but this is Penang. So I change it here to the donkey and the durian. <laughs> so in the old days you may have known or seen that poor people would use donkey carts. The donkey would pull the cart and sometimes there were people in the cart, sometimes there was produce in the cart. But it was very hard to make the donkey pull the cart. Donkeys are stubborn. If you take a stick and try and hit the donkey, the donkey won't move. That's not what you use the stick for. You tie the stick to the donkey's neck. So the front of the stick is about two foot in front of the donkey's mouth. On the end of the stick you tie a string, on the end of the string you tie a piece of durian. And so the donkey sees this durian two foot in front of its mouth. If you were that donkey, what would you do? You'd move towards the piece of durian, you can smell it, you can see it, but you just can't reach it. So you pull harder, you go faster, but it doesn't matter how fast that donkey goes after the jury, it never reaches it. And that's how they get the donkey to pull the cart. Unfortunately, good meditation teachers have now come to Penang. So you can't use that trick to get donkeys to pull the cart anymore. The donkeys have heard how to catch the durian. I always say it's very easy once you know. What the donkey does, it pulls that cart really hard, it goes as fast as it can after the durian. It knows it's not going to reach it yet. It's always about two foot in front of its mouth. It goes really as fast as it can. But what the donkey hears, hears and learns from meditation teachers is how to stop, how to let go, how to not go running after things. So the donkey stops. And because of momentum, that durian starts swinging away from it. It goes further away from the donkey than it's ever been before. Four foot in front of its mouth, it swings away because the donkey has stopped. But the donkey knows what's going to happen next. He doesn't get frightened, he's going to lose his durian. He's got confidence and faith in his teacher. So the donkey just waits. <laughs> Can you do that? <laughs> and he goes four foot in front of its mouth and then it starts swinging towards the donkey. And soon it's two foot in front of the donkey's mouth, the usual place. But this time it's coming at full speed towards the donkey's mouth. And soon it's right next to his mouth. And the donkey has to remember one last teaching. That one last teaching is kindness. He says to that piece of Jurian, Jurian, the door of my mouth is open to you. <laughs> Otherwise, have you seen how big the teeth of donkeys are? It just bounce on the outside and lose its opportunity if you have a nice Jurian. That's how you catch Jurians. You run really fast, you know you're not going to catch it that way, you run and then you stop. And once you stop, Durian goes further away and then swings right towards you and straight into your mouth. Simple. That's how you meditate. You've been trying so hard. And that's why many, many times 
meditators on the last day of their retreat, they give up and they stop. And their meditation limiters or peace, whatever you want, goes further away from you. But then it starts swimming in towards you. To your great surprise, it comes right into your mouth. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. So anyway, what I would suggest to you tonight, if you haven't got any limiters yet, forget about it. Give up. You're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> Stop. And then it will come to you. Tonight. <laughs> so that's the story of the jury and, and the, the donkey. It's a powerful one, it really works. Goodness. So Anapana, Vipassana, they're both the same. Do they lead to liberation? Of course they both do. But you need to Actually, the need of liberation, because if you need, want to do Anapanasati, you have to do the whole Eightfold Path. If you want to do Vipassana, you have to do the whole Eightfold Path. If you want to do loving-kindness meditation, you have to do the whole Eightfold Path. When something is missing, your car won't work. Good evening, Ajahn Brahm. I would like to clarify on one of the five precepts. Adultery. Oh. Well, I can actually see. Does anyone recognize this handwriting? <laughs> People like to ask these questions. Okay, here we go. A friend of mine. A friend of mine viewed that buying sex is noble because it is helping prostitutes to earn a living, to feed her family. Having bodily pleasure with other women is okay as long as the husband takes care and provides all necessities to the wife and children. He viewed that this is not extreme and is following the middle way. In this samsara, what is Ajahn's view on this? The middle way. It's not the middle way. We call that the muddle way. <laughs> Ask your wife about that. Ask your kids about that. Tell your boss at work. So that's what you do. Would you be embarrassed? You should be. If you really want to um, help somebody who's, say, a prostitute to feed her family, just give her the money. But don't ask anything back. That's real charity. Getting something back for yourself is not charity at all. And it's also, it makes things very, very difficult this is just like making excuses. That's what I would say. In the middle way, avoiding extremes, one of those extremes is the sensual pleasure of, you know, of, um, of, of things like adultery. It never actually works. Every time I've seen anyone practice adultery, it's always led to so much problems in the family and life. You ask your wife, is that okay, wife, if I sleep with another woman? And she'll say, no, 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 no. Am I correct? You don't even try it. It's not the middle way, again, it's the muddle way. But there's also, there's an old Chinese saying about the middle way. The one who walks the middle way gets hit by traffic coming in both directions. <laughs> so be careful of the middle way. Will breaking the adultery precepts lead to hell realm? It can do, because sometimes your guilt gets incredibly strong. If any of you have committed adultery, it doesn't necessarily lead to a hell realm. It leads to a lot of pain and suffering in this realm. But if you can learn how to forgive yourself and learn from it and never do it again, you don't have to have a bad rebirth afterwards. There was this one, she was a Japanese woman who comes to my temple. And she was taking her husband's suit to the cleaners to be dry cleaned. 
and she noticed there was a piece of paper in one of the pockets. When she took it out, she found it was a receipt from a prostitute. And that really shocked her. She thought she had a good relationship with her husband. So she confronted her husband. Have you been visiting prostitutes? And he confessed, yes, I have. At least he was honest. And that was almost the end of their relationship. She said, I can't trust you anymore. They were both Buddhists. They both came to my temple. So they spent about an hour with both of them, you know, trying to find out a solution to this problem. Now he really said he made big mistake, he still loved his wife. For many women that's almost impossible to believe, especially when they've cheated on you once. Are they telling the truth? And he said, look, I will never ever do that again. I really am sorry. And I got him to bow to the Buddha and ask forgiveness in front of his wife and then bow to me and ask forgiveness and promise he would never do it again. That was not enough. So having forgiveness, when you've done something like that, sometimes is not acceptable to the wife. So I took forgiveness to another level. I said, forgiveness but with uh, probation. So probation, I said, it's up to you wife, one year or six months, or five years if you want. In that one year, they decided on one year, she had to have full access to his mobile phone, full access to his internet, all the passwords, so he, he, she could check on him at any time and he had to be open to her to prove where he'd been and what he'd been doing for one year to prove to his wife that he really was changing and being faithful to her. And the lovely thing was he did that, she accepted that, and now they're back together again living a wonderful life, coming to our monastery once a week with food out of gratitude. We saved their marriage. She really wanted to know that it was a mistake, he would never, ever, 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 ever do it again. And he proved that with what we call probation. So if your husband or wife has been misbehaving, you don't need to say the relationship is you know, as usual. Put them on probation. Six months, one year, whatever. So you can check up on them. They have to prove where they've been if they come back late from work. Does that make sense? It actually works. And I was very proud and happy to see it actually worked. And they're a very happy couple again. When people make a mistake, and they do make mistakes. Men sometimes get tempted. So please, you know, you have to protect yourself and also make sure that you can trust the people you stay with. Anyway, will breaking the adultery precept lead to hell realm? It can do. In this modern world, many youngsters have premarital sex with their boyfriends or girlfriends. As they are not married, does this break the precept? Basically, that's an, that doesn't break the precept. It has to be, as they say, consensual. So the boy and the girl are free to give their consent. They're not married yet, and they're not somehow under age. It's not with a teacher and their disciple. Because teachers, whether it's a, a monk teacher or a nun teacher or a teacher in school, they have power over the other person and they can abuse that power. And I know that in many religious schools in the West, that power was abused. And many of those teachers, they were having sex with their students and the students felt they had to. And that was breaking a precept. If it is consensual, 
no free, and the person, yeah, I want to do this, that can be okay, but it's still dangerous. What happens if a pregnancy happens? Who suffers the most? It's the girl. So please, you have a right to say no. And the boy has to accept that. Otherwise, you know, you feel that you're being abused again. And that's, you know, not right. It's, it's quite wonderful, we do have that precept, and in the West we keep it. Now, when I was a young man, I, I can't understand why a young man would be going out with two or three girls. There's no way that I could afford anything like that. And one girlfriend was enough worry. <laughs> so I only had one girlfriend at, at a time. And then sort of later on, so I have no girlfriends, I didn't need them anymore. Indulgence in sex and food pleasures. Which one, which one has heavier bad karma? Or are they the same? Food karma has, uh, indulging in food karma has a heavier result on your tummy. But the sexual karma has a heavier effect uh, on your karma and rebirth, simply because it, it uh, affects another person, it's not just you. I hope I answered that accurately for you. It's a very important question. I know that that must have come from like a man. Because many women, they've been hurt, you know, by adultery. And it just really hurts very, very deeply. When I've seen that, and, and women have spoken to me about it, I just really want to protect you as much as possible by telling all the guys, please don't do that. Respect your wife. The Buddha gave these five precepts, and eight precepts even, for a reason not to cause you trouble, but to protect you, to create peace and happiness for you. What happens when nature calls when one is in deep jhana? <laughs> no, you don't wet your pants. What happens is your body is so peaceful, the nature doesn't call. <laughs> the story I haven't told here, but I, I love telling these stories, and this is a story which happened in Sydney. There was a Vietnamese Theravada monk, a forest monk, who was teaching a meditation retreat. Now in Vietnam, in the southern part of Vietnam, close to you know, what was Cambodia in the old days, now the Khmer Republic, there were many Theravada monks. And many of those Theravada monks would again live in the forests and the jungles, just like the Thai monks. And some were very good meditators. One of these Thai forest monks was invited to Sydney where there's many Vietnamese uh, migrants to teach a meditation retreat. And so he started the retreat by, when they came on a Friday evening, by giving a half an hour meditation, and it's supposed to be followed by the talk, the introductory talk, at eight o'clock. So he was there at 7.30 meditating. When it came to eight o'clock, he continued meditating. He never came out of his meditation. At nine o'clock he was still meditating. Nine-thirty, still meditating. So all of the people on the retreat, all the lay people, what would you do? They left the hall and went to bed. <laughs> and left him there. When they got up in the morning for the morning meditation and morning chanting, he was still sitting there. He didn't move. They never did any chanting, he kept on meditating. 
When he came to the breakfast, he never got up to go for the breakfast, he carried on meditating. He sat there for eight days without moving, without going to the toilet, without drinking. Just sat there like a Buddha statue. And after the eighth day, he came out of his meditation. And when he opened his eyes, the first thing he said was, I apologize. I got into a very deep meditation and just time just had no meaning for me. It flew by. When I came out, I should have been teaching you. I'm sorry I didn't give you any talks. You know what the Vietnamese Buddhists said? They said, no, thank you so much. It was so inspiring to see that there are some teachers that don't just talk, talk, talk. They actually practice and they can do that these days, go into a very deep meditation. He never drank any water. He never went to toilet. He never lay down to sleep. He was sitting cross-legged without moving for eight days. And that was kind of strange because the maximum I thought was possible was seven days, but he did eight. So if nature calls when you're in China, you just don't hear the message. <laughs> and you don't need to either. You are perfectly healthy. And I remember the first day, all those other stories I told you about the jhanas, about that video which I have back in Perth, but it's got a, a Sinhalese soundtrack about this gentleman who, he was a doctor, and his student, you know, the following my teachings could get into these jhanas really easy. Because he was a doctor, he decided, he videoed this, to actually to do an incision on his arm while he was in jhana. Without his permission, this guy never knew a thing. So the doctor sort of exposed his arm, just disinfected it with some alcohol, you know, medicine, medicinal, and then got out a scalpel and tried to cut his arm, make an incision. He was a doctor, he knew what he was doing. The scalpel would not penetrate the skin. No matter how hard, no matter how sharp the scalpel was, it just wouldn't go through. And so he just you know, wiped the arm and told him about it afterwards. It's on, it's on video. And then he asked this, um, his student again, can I try that again? And the student said, yeah, sure, no worries, I trust you. They were really good friends for a long time. So the next time, with the permission, the student got into a deep meditation. The doctor exposed his arm, disinfected it, took out the scalpel, and this time, because he had permission, the scalpel penetrated, and the blood came out. So the doctor gave a couple of stitches, and then disinfected the, the wound, put some ointment on or something, and then put the bandage on. And that was kind of weird, the first time I've actually seen this, that if you have permission, then you can do that. Without that permission, you are invulnerable. And of course, while this was being done, you know, to, without any anesthetic, just no disinfecting, that's not enough to keep the pain away, you could cut the, the arm, it didn't feel a thing. It was in deep meditation. The body senses have disappeared. And that's just what happens in deep meditation. So if you want to come and prove in deep meditation, just come up here, I'll get a sharp knife. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you experience any pain. <laughs> it's weird, but it's very safe. So basically you don't. You don't feel nature or hear nature's calls. You're perfectly still, peaceful, and nothing can harm you. Next question. In the law of karma, if a bad thought arises when we get angry, 
but it did not turn into speech or action because we are aware. Does this turn into bad karma too? How to continue to minimize this? It's very weak, bad karma. It's just a thought. But the problem is if you keep on thinking like that, sooner or later it turns into words. There was an old story of a Christian monastery many years ago. And there, it was a strict monastery. All the people there, all the monks there, they had to keep silent. They weren't allowed to talk at all, except for once every seven years. Once every seven years, they could go and see the teacher, the abbot, and they were allowed to say one sentence, but just one sentence and no more. So this young man joined this monastery. He was very good. For seven or six years, 11 months and 30 days, he hadn't said a word. The next day he was going to see the abbot to say his first sentence. And you can imagine how excited he was. And he, hadn't, he didn't sleep the night before. He was so excited. He was planning something profound to say, to impress the abbey. You know how we always like to impress others? But when he went into the abbot's room, his mind went blank. And when he was asked what his question was, he said, the food in this monastery is terrible. <laughs> he wished he hadn't have said that. That's not what he intended. But it just came out. And he couldn't say, sorry, can I say something else? And he said, come back in another seven years. <laughs> really hard. So <laughs> he waited. And 13 years, 11 months and 30 days, second time he could say anything. And this time he had a rest to make sure he wasn't so tense, he wouldn't blow it and make a mistake. When he came into the abbot's office, the same thing happened. The excitement was so great, the mind went blank, he forgot what he was going to say, and he says, you make us work too hard here. <laughs> so he had to wait another seven years. But after 21 years, just saying those two sentences of complaint, which just came out from him, he had his next opportunity. This time he really was relaxed. And when he went into the abbot's office, he said exactly what he meant to say. He said to the abbot, I can't stand this place any longer, I'm leaving. <laughs> and the abbot replied, very good, you've done nothing but complain ever since you came here. <laughs> the reason why those two complaints came out, because that's what he was thinking silently all the time. And as all the plans you have or what you mean to say, just don't come out. It's the same any of you who are married. How do you speak to one another? Sometimes how you speak is how you've been thinking about your partner. So be careful. If you want to change the way you speak, so you don't speak angry words, especially to a partner or to a boss who drives you crazy, always remember that wonderful Chinese saying, to love the tiger, but at a distance. In other words, you don't go up to a tiger and give him a kiss you bite your hand off, or mouth off, or everything off. At a distance, it means that your partner, if you're having a difficult time with them, just you know, be alone for a little while, and then give them some kindness from a distance, when they're not right in front of you. And you think, they're just a human being, they're not perfect, but you're not perfect, that's why you married, you're a match. <laughs> <laughs> And then you're kind to your partner at a distance. If you're kind at a distance, then when you actually see them in front of you, you're kind and it surprises you how easy that is. You can't change habits when they're right in front of you. You change the habits at a distance and you give them kindness at a distance.
and then it works. So that's the how bad speech comes from bad thoughts. And the bad thoughts repeated, 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 and then that eventually turns into a bad, so the bad thoughts repeated, 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 turns into bad speech when you're in front of them. And it's much more pleasant having good speech, kind speech, but that means you have kind thoughts, and good thoughts towards one another. Can you please tell us how to deal with competitiveness? I am a quiet, competitive person. I find that it motivates me to do better. But sometimes when I see someone doing better than me, it gives me negative emotions, such as jealousy and self-doubt. How do I deal with this? I don't know that in your field of study, your field of work, do you really want to get on? and become management, and top management, or CEO. Do your research before you get promoted to be a manager. Look at how the managers have to work, and how hard they have to work. Do you really want that? Yes, but they get more money. It doesn't matter how much money you get from the company. It's never enough. So because of that, when you look at the people in higher management, they have a terrible lifestyle. I don't know, actually I do know why I got talked into being abbot of a monastery. That was a big mistake. <laughs> the only reason I did that, because the monk who was senior, I had another monk who was senior to me. And I thought, this is perfect. Because when you have someone who's senior, they have to do all the work, and you like tailgate them. They get all the bugs on their windscreen, I get nothing. But once they disrobed, then I got all the bugs on my windscreen. <laughs> it's much nicer being a second monk or a third monk. Not being the head of the organization, it's just too much responsibility and stress. Instead, just be this person who's really good but never gets promoted. You live a very happy life that way. Do you agree with me? Don't think about the money because if you get promoted and become CEO, the medical bills go up. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to do better, but not out of competitiveness. It's nice to do better just out of service. That idea of service, and if someone can do it better than me, fine. We'll do it together and I'll learn from you to also to do better. The service is something which I really appreciate. Just before I came here, my BSWA, they asked for, can you say a few kind words to all the volunteers who work for my temple over in Western Australia? There's lots of them. And I was just saying that success is never... Success is never measured by what you accumulate, but how much you give. The volunteering, the, the sacrifice, the service. If you do so much, a lot of service, then you're a very successful human being. You may think that, oh no, no, I need to survive, I need to have food. Other people get food, and nice food, why not me? But when you pass away and you look at the karma you've achieved over all these years, the service, the giving, the volunteering, that's where you get the most. You get so much joy. Anyway, but sometimes when I see someone doing better than me, it gives me negative emotions. Oh, you know you have, there's a quality in Buddhism called mudita, or mudita. You know what that means? You rejoice in other people's success and goodness. And I don't know why people throw the opportunity to have free happiness and joy. You see someone doing so much good service, they're doing such a good job. You don't get jealous, you get inspired. Well done! Oh, that really makes me feel so happy. It's a free happiness. 
which is the opposite of jealousy. So when you're jealous, you're giving away an opportunity for free happiness. Self-doubt. It's okay to have self-doubt. There's no one in there anyway. No self. If there's no self, how can you have self-doubt? <laughs> anyway. Good evening. If I am very sick, how to communicate with my body? How to make peace with my body? That's a good question. You still can do that. One of the times, in fact, probably the, the most sick I have ever been was when I had scrub typhus in northeast Thailand. I was only maybe one or two years as a monk, only maybe 23 or 24 years old. I was fit, healthy. This fever got me, and this was scrub typhus. No one knew what it was because according to the health department, there was no scrub typhus in northeast Thailand. There was, but everyone had immunity. The locals had immunity. But when we Western monks went there, we had no immunity, so we all caught it, the scrub typhus. And they thought it was typhoid. They gave us typhoid medicine. That didn't work. And just to let you know what hospitals were like in those days, when I went to that hospital, they just you know, put a drip in me, they hadn't got a clue what fever I had, so they just gave a cocktail of antibiotics in the morning and in the afternoon, injected into my bum. And by a nurse. You may think that Thai women are really beautiful. This one certainly wasn't. <laughs> she was built like a water buffalo. She had to be, because they never injected you. These were the days, 50 years ago, or 48 years ago, when all the needles were reused. So they had to be used, and then they were oiled or steamed or something to try and um, take away any in infectious stuff in them. And then they bunged inside your backside again. She never injected me, she stabbed me. <laughs> And it really hurt. You know, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. It was like, you know, just going to the headmaster's study. And even though I was a very sincere monk, I never could do loving kindness to her. <laughs> May all beings be happy and well, but not her. <laughs> and after a week, my backside was really sore. And that was a small part of it because you had a fever as well and you were just so weak and you didn't have any support. You didn't have any bedpans. So you're in your bed and you just had to sort of lurch to the toilet. And I only went to the toilet once a day and I stayed there a long time to do everything because I didn't want to make that trip twice. And it was very, very unpleasant. And even when Ajahn Chah came to see me, I've already mentioned to you what he told me. First of all, you see this amazing teacher come and see you. And I thought, wow, he's come to see me? And that just lifted up your spirits so, so high. And they fell down so low when he spoke. <laughs> Brahma Wangsa. You're either, going to, you're either going to get better or you're going to die. <laughs> either way, the sickness is not going to last. I didn't like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part, you can't argue with that. That was wisdom. It is not compassionate. So you're left by yourself. You, you, I, I never felt so little energy in my life. It's hard to even get up. And just basically, I think I was probably dying slowly. But then, what do you do? I was a meditator. So I decided, well, let's do some meditation. Weird thing, because you had no energy. 
There's no way you can sit up and cross your legs. I just was laying down there with my feet all over the place, arms all over the place, sweating. So I decided to meditate. When I decided to meditate, it really worked. It sort of stunned me. You got into a very deep meditation where your body totally vanished. And you were in bliss. Now that bliss meant so much more when you just come out of just one of the worst body states you could possibly have. Fever, exhaustion, pain, backside which was aching on both sides. And you'd left your body, not, well, not floating up, going deep inside into one of the deep meditation states. That was gorgeous. Just the the contrast between what was happening before and what was happening in the meditation was just so amazing. When I came out of that meditation, the first thing I looked at was my posture. i never ever seen a posture like that recommended in any meditation book. <laughs> the body was just totally disheveled all over the place. But it worked. And I wasn't wise enough, but I'm pretty sure, and I wasn't wise enough to check, but pretty sure that that's where the fever broke. And the, whatever disease it was, it was scrub typhus, whether that was just sapped. Because that's what the deep meditations do. I still remember Ajahn Chah's story of how he overcame malaria. Malaria was like the forest monk's disease. Everybody got it in those days because there was so much in the forest and that's where the monks used to live. And he said that one day that he was having a really strong fever, but instead of trying to get rid of the fever, he decided to try something different, actually go inside of the fever. He described it like being in the middle of a forest when there was a forest fire, forest fire a conflagration. Everything was burning around him. But where he sat in the middle was cool. And it got hotter and hotter, but where he was was always tolerable. Hotter and hotter and hotter until the forest, the fire, exploded. And that was the end of his, um, what's it called, malaria fever. Never had malaria again. It's an interesting way of dealing with it. Go inside the place of stillness where the heat can't get to you, where your body has vanished. And that was how he dealt with his um, malaria. So how to communicate with your body, how to make peace with your body. Understand the body. You've had it for so many years, do you really know it? You ask your... Look, there's also this other story, which is a good story. One of the monks over in Perth. You know, he, every time he meditated, he always had a sore back. So he eventually went to see the doctor. The doctor did a scan of his back and gave him the news. He's got a congenital defect in his spine. He said, there's nothing we can do about it. So he said, I would advise you not to meditate. He said, I'm a monk. <laughs> That's like advising a Penangi not to eat durian. <laughs> a Penangi, I can't do that, I have to. But anyway, anyway, so he came back thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Now, I, I love meditating, I'm a monk. But every time I sit, it's painful because of a congenital defect in his spine. So he did some research and he got a little book about learning how to be mindful of parts of his body which none of us are really mindful of. On either side of his spine, the book noted with diagrams, there's muscles which we just have no awareness of. So the book pointed out where those muscles are and he had to do the exercise of rubbing with his fingers each one of those muscles on either side of his spine for 15 minutes minimum every morning. And he did that for about three months, rubbing those muscles every morning until he could feel those muscles, just like I can feel my hands. 
I can feel my head. He could feel those muscles. Now for the next three months, by trial and error, learn how to move those muscles. And eventually he learned how to move them. Now, exercise them every morning. And he exercised both those muscles. He could move them, I can't. I don't even know where those muscles are, but I can't move them. He learned how to move them. And then when he exercised them, they became so strong that they compensated for the weakness in his spine and now he can sit in meditation with no pain at all. And I thought that was a brilliant solution. He learned about his body, some parts of your body you don't realize you can have some control over. You can exercise it. And he did that and it solved the problem. It's amazing what control you can have on your body, how you can influence it, how you can look at some of the, your digestion and just heal things, just by kindness and awareness. That's actually what he did. Instead of, you know, he's still a monk, it was great. That's how you communicate with your body, make peace with your body. Learn from it. Okay, oh, this one. Please explain the difference between Cheto Vimuti, Pani Vimuti, Ubato Bhaga Vimuti. Thank you. Each one of these is a description of someone uh, entering Nibbana, you know, being enlightened. It literally means Cheto Vimuti means freedom of the mind, Panya, freedom through wisdom, and Ubato Bhaga Vimuti, freedom, freedom through both. In particular, it means one of them, the Panyavimuti and Chittavimuti, that means the freedom by at least experiencing the four jhanas. Ubato Bhagavimuti means uh, experiencing immaterial attainments as well. Each one needs the jhanas. It's only one way to enlightenment, which is the Eightfold Path, which includes the jhanas. It's a technical point, but if you look at their definitions, it's either with the four jhanas or with more than the four jhanas. It's a technical point. Dear Ajahn Brahm, good evening. This is the fourth day into retreat, but I'm not making any progress in my meditation, being sleepy most of the times. What are your suggestions? Sleep some more. <laughs> Honestly, because sometimes you need lots of sleep, sometimes you don't need much at all. And you know how much you need by how you feel. And you're not listening to your body. Sometimes your body is telling you, I do need some more sleep. And it's much better to take an extra hour of sleep and spend the whole day fighting sleepiness. And then when you get up, you may be getting up later than any, everybody else, you come up here and your mind is ready to meditate, it's prepared. And it's not a joke, I'm not doing this to get more disciples, I've got too many disciples already. I'm doing this because this is how it works. It's the middle way. You know what happened with the Buddha? Once he discovered that middle way, he had to rest more, had to eat more, had to wash, had to live you know, much more close to the thing we call the middle way. And when he did that, his first five disciples thought he'd given up. It didn't look like he was trying anymore. How could he get enlightened when he wasn't trying so hard? They abandoned him. But when he came to see them, they could see that something had happened, something amazing. That's why he taught them the middle way, first of all. Get your body healthy, rested, and well fed enough, comfortable, able to sit there and not have to worry about your body. And that made them all enlightened too. Well, or do it just like 
Do I just accept myself in order to feel contented and happy? No, just get your body content first, then the mind becomes content. This is only the fourth day. It's like you're a very good disciple because I advise you on the first day, remember, don't get enlightened on the first few days. <laughs> Otherwise you don't know what to do with yourself on the last few days if you're enlightened on the third or fourth day. Don't give up. Just be patient and don't want anything in the whole world. This is good enough. The less you want, the more progress you make. If sati is referred to mindfulness, then what is awareness? Are they the same or different? Mindfulness is almost like focused awareness. Actually, it's more than that because I always say that you need the kindness as well to be able to keep the mindfulness in one place. Everyone is aware. Even people who go to the pub are aware. They always manage to find their way home somehow. They must have some awareness. But mindfulness is much stronger. And it's also the focuses of mindfulness, the four focuses of mindfulness. What are you aware of? You're aware of this body. You're aware of these experiences, these feelings. You're aware of the mind. There's so few people practice that third satipatthana. They all think they do. They've got no idea what the mind is. They've never been in a jhana. How can you know what the mind is if you've never seen it? So kind of isolated from the other five senses. How can you know what gold is when it's got other elements in it? That was a Buddhist simile. So if you want to do this mindfulness on these, uh, that's only three of them, the fourth is the mind objects. When the only way you can actually do that is by experiences deep meditations. And when you do, you have an understanding of what this mind actually is. You get insights into it. Direct. You've got the data. And you've got the clarity of mind to see what's going on. One of the results of that, if you get into a jhana and you see this mind, you will never be afraid of death. You understand what it is. Body dies. The stream of consciousness, the mind, just carries on for one. Not forever, but for a long time. You're not afraid of death. Many of you, when you get really old, I shouldn't say that, should I? Bring it on. <laughs> You're not afraid at all. Anyway. Can you teach us how to deal with other people's judgments and criticism as well as the fear of being judged and worrying about what other people think of you? Goodness gracious. What do other people think of me? Maybe you all know me and so you give me respect. But dressing up like this in the West. You know one time I did really feel comfortable in the West. I'd just gone to visit my brother in north of London. And he dropped me off at the, the underground railway station. And I was going to catch a train into London to give a talk. And I was the first on the train. I got there early. It was an underground train, but this was at the terminus. And I was sitting in there minding my own business. Then, honestly, a couple of zombies came on. <laughs> and then a couple of witches. And then all these weird people came on. I thought, what was going on? And I realized it was October the 31st. <laughs> Halloween's day. And of all the <laughs> they're all going into London for parties, Halloween's parties. <laughs> and they looked at me. <laughs> what party are you going to? <laughs> It was the first time I felt I belonged and wasn't weird on an underground train. That's true, it actually happened, it was weird. 
So you're not worried what other people think of you because you've got confidence. This is my robes and it's how I, how I look. I can't shave my hair. I'm not at all sort of um, worried what other people think of me. That means I can be at peace. And sometimes that confidence, that's the best thing which people can see. Not weird clothes on you, but the confidence and the kindness, the smile on you. That's the best. What is the most important quality that one should have to be in the robe? A body. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, you'll be in a robe. Many people, monks and nuns, men and women, they put a robe on to have some idea of what it's like to be a monk or a nun and to practice. It's that honesty, I would say, the honesty to try and figure out what it is, not have any ideas what you're going to do, but just know what it's, kind of find out what it's like to be a mendicant, someone who has no possessions. No, I, I don't have a mobile phone. And I love not having a mobile phone. I have a, a, a tablet, to get emails, but not a mobile phone. I'm one of the few monks who have the, no mobile phone. It's very helpful. In the old days in Thailand, we were warned about mobile phones. Because many, some monks, you know, were quite charismatic. And sometimes some of their female lay disciples would offer them a mobile phone. So you need a mobile phone, Ajahnbo, have a mobile phone. In those days, the most common mobile phone was Nokia. And it was a scam, because those ladies, they really liked that monk, and they would start ringing him up, is there anything you need? And they would start, because they had the number, they actually bought the phone for them. Anything you need, and the telephone calls would get later and later and later into the night. And some of the senior monks in Thailand said, many monks died the Nokia death. <laughs> <laughs> they got seduced and eventually disrobed. Because you know, someone who really liked them had the opportunity to contact them at all times of the night. So, so anyway, that's why it's nice to be simple. What do you need actually to be quality to be in a robe? You have all sorts of qualities to begin with, but they develop. I think it's more important what qualities do you need to stay in a robe? And those qualities are seeing the beautiful benefits of meditation, of purity, and also the benefits you can share with other people, how much you can give to others. Some of these talks which I've given. You know, I've been put on YouTube, podcast for you know, decades now. The number of people who know me is immense. And every now and again you, you see them in the weirdest of places. A good example of that is in Paddington Station. Not this last trip, the trip before. I was walking you know, from the underground station to the train I was taking to Oxford to give a talk. And as I was walking there, this young English lady, she was African English, came running towards me. And she stopped in front of me and said, Are you the YouTube monk? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, Yes, you are. And I said, well, I, I do, my talks to go on YouTube. You're Ajahn Brown, what are you doing in Paddington? You're supposed to be in Australia. Yeah, but I visit. <coughs> and then she started to gush. Said, I was suicidal when my relationship with my boyfriend, long-term relationship, fell apart. And I had free access to psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, friends, and nothing worked. And I was so low and so close to suicide, I went online and I just Googled all sorts of things. 
and came up with one of your talks and it did the trick. And then she binged on one Ajahn Brahm talk after another for about seven or eight hours. She said, it worked. And she said, you saved my life. She meant that. I imagine how that feels if someone comes up to you and says, you saved my life and explains what she means. And that's not the only person who's been hundreds who said that. And that's what keeps you in the robes. You're doing great service to so many people, not just Buddhists, but people who are just desperate and they just go online and they come up with your talk and it saves their lives. And that just gives you so much joy and happiness. Anyway, how can a walk in meditation develop our concentration and mindfulness? Very, very easy. Because that you're doing walking meditation, it doesn't hurt the body, the body is always moving. So you don't get the aches and pains in your body like you do when you're sitting. Now obviously if you get into a deep meditation when you're sitting, you don't feel any aches or pains at all, not even afterwards. But that's few people who actually do that all the time. So you do some walking meditation, you're exercising also, and you can become very still. I did mention, I think this morning, I think it was yesterday, about doing a walking meditation, becoming so into the movement of your feet, that when I heard the sound, Brahma Wang So, it's like hearing something from a million miles away. Oh, and it was a monk shouting in my ear, that far away from my ear hole. And he was doing that because I'd forgotten an appointment. I was supposed to go to a, a ceremony and I'd forgotten it. He was sent to come and get me. At least he knew what I was up to in deep meditation. I was just doing walking meditation. I'd almost left the whole world. But I still was aware enough of the feet moving, so I, I never needed to bump into anything. It just showed me just how calm and peaceful you can become doing walking meditation. And then afterwards you go and sit meditation. It's just easy to make that transition from the calm of walking meditation into the deep meditations of jhana. It's really valuable. Dear Ajahn, I had been feeling drowsy. The whole morning since I woke up at 5.15 a.m. today and doing Ajahn's, during Ajahn's talk was planning to sit down and rest or lie down and rest after the talk. But when Ajahn started chanting and sharing the words with the sponsor of food today, my mind woke up instantly and tears started to roll down and I Fear I won't go back to sleep as planned. Why is it so, Ajahn? Are these tears of joy and gratitude? Absolutely. You know, sometimes things really inspire you. And when it sort of hits that part inside your mind, you don't know what it actually is, but it really inspires you. And you get a high, inspired, lots of joy and happiness. And then you can't go to sleep. That's one of the things, you know, with any beautiful state of mind, inspiration gives you so much energy. And that's also the case with the jhanas. Honestly, if you get into a real jhana, you know, in the last half hour, half an hour before 10 p.m., you won't be able to go to sleep. You don't want to go to sleep. You're having a wonderful time. Who wants to go to sleep when you're blissing out? And you don't suffer from that at all. You know, because in the morning you're still high energy. Inspiration gives you enormous energy. But there was this one case, occasion. In the early days in Thailand, if you were ordained as a monk, you had to make your own robes. A set of three robes, the outer robe, the sangati, and the inner robe from white cloth. You had to measure them, sew them, and then dye them. And that was really hard work. And there was these three monks preparing to ordain. 
They'd already been working for three, no, for two nights. They hadn't slept. They weren't allowed to sleep. They had to just work and see how serious you are about being a monk. And the rule was you had to do it by yourself. No one could help you. But I think you know my character. One evening after the evening meeting, I snuck to the dying shed and I said, you guys have been just without sleep for about 48 hours. You must feel terrible. Just go back to your huts. I'll look after the dye pot all night. They never argued. <laughs> they were off. <laughs> and so I looked after the dye pot, breaking the monastery rules all night out of kindness. And in the morning when the bell went, the bell used to go at 3 a.m., so they came up and just having that three or four hours sleep meant everything to them. They were energized again, not totally, but at least they could have a bit more feeling of a healthy body. And then they went to the morning meeting. They went back to my hut. And that morning meeting, starting at 3.30, the chanting, I was chanting with full energy, really loud. Then we did some meditation. I wasn't at all sleepy. I hadn't slept all night. I've been working hard on the dye pot. And my energy was huge. Then we went on arms round. And I didn't feel any tiredness at all. It was so weird. I hadn't slept. I'd worked hard at the night time. And had so much energy. And I asked one of the senior monks on the way back from arms round, what on earth is going on? And he told me that when you help others and serve others selflessly, you get inspiration. And that inspiration is a great source of energy. Energy which is pure. You can't construct, it's not like having a cup of coffee. It's actually like pure energy of kindness. You don't feel tired at all. You try that out and it's beautiful. I did confess that I broke the rules. I said, oh, never mind, it was kind. Okay. Can you talk about death and after death and how to use mindfulness to ensure the last thought is right? As understood, last thought is the one being used to where we'll be going. I'll only do it briefly. Once there was a Sri Lankan businessman. And this Sri Lankan businessman was what we call a Waisak Buddhist. He'd only go to the temple on the holiest day of the year on Waisak. The rest of the day he was just too busy at his business. But when he went to the temple on Waisak, he heard the monk there giving the lecture, saying the most important thing is to make sure that when you die you have a good thought. And then you're bound to go to heaven. And the monk actually said one of the best thoughts you can have when you die is thinking about the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, the triple gem. So this was a guy who liked business. He didn't like going to the temple. He didn't like giving donations, hanging around for boring sermons. And at last he, he got a really nice piece of advice. All you need to do is think about Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha in your last moment you're guaranteed to go to heaven. So as he was going back home, he realized a nice plan of how to beat the system, so he thought. The next day he saw a lawyer and he legally changed the names of his three sons. <laughs> the eldest was called now Buddha, the second son, Dhamma, and the third son, Sangha. Because he knew that when he gets on his deathbed, his three sons will be there. In Penang it's the same, isn't it? You expect your sons to be there. And so anyway, his plan was working. From that day on, he never went to the temple, never gave a donation, no food offerings, nothing. He didn't need it anymore, he's going to go to heaven. And so when he got on his deathbed many years later, his plan was working perfectly. His three sons were by his bedside as he was getting sicker and sicker, getting closer and closer to dying. And he looked at his three sons, Buddha, Dhamma, 
Sangha. I'm going to heaven. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. I was going right according to plan until just at one moment he thought, if my three sons are here by my bedside, who's looking after my shop? <laughs> and that's when he died. <laughs> so your last thought is a combination of all the other thoughts you've had in your life. You can't somehow suddenly change to a nice thought, a good thought, when you've been having bad thoughts most of your life. So anyway, I don't know if that's enough for you, but anyway, it's enough for me. There's <laughs> only, actually, there's only actually uh, four questions left. Shall I carry on? I didn't realize I'd done so many. Anyway, here we go. I'll carry on for a little bit. Ajahn, you said that when a person dies, his mind consciousness continues into the next life. Does this mean that consciousness is eternal? No. If not, what is eternal in us? Eternal in you is nothing. Nothing is eternal. So when you see the great emptiness, that's going to last forever. <laughs> you are a stream of consciousness. Is a stream eternal? It looks eternal. If you see, Penang is a, not really a good place to talk about streams. Are there, are there any rivers in Penang? I haven't seen any. <laughs> the only bridge I've seen is over freeways. But the River Thames. You look at the River Thames, it looks exactly the same as when I grew up. But none of the water is the same. Sometimes during floods or droughts, it changes its course slightly. It looks pretty much the same. That's like you. You change slightly, you get older, weaker, but some things always, they look the same. Even those of you who say, I say the same old jokes again and again and again. I don't. They change slightly every time. <laughs> that's, like, that's like your stream of consciousness. It can be recognizable in your next life. If someone has known you well, it's not the same. It keeps on growing until one time when you don't need to be reborn ever again. You've understood the Dhamma. Dear Ajahn, is regret healthy? I will say no. Instead of just regret, you know what you've done in the past, you learn from it, and you let it go. You acknowledge, forgive, learn. So don't hide mistakes. Acknowledge them, but don't sort of feel guilty and want punishment, just learn from them and then you've done the best you possibly can. I used to be a school teacher before I became a monk. And that's why I always look at the people sitting in the back. Because in class, all the naughty children sat in the back. <laughs> so now I see you all. <laughs> Teacher's pets sat in the front. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it? Um, what was I talking about? <laughs> I really am getting tired now. What was I saying before? Regret. So I had to set a, my first maths exam. And I had to ask advice. How do you set an exam? A very, one very wise teacher told me that don't set it too easy. If all your children in your class get you know, 100% or 99%, it, it's not worth anything. 
don't set it too hard. If everybody gets 10%, 20%, they'll think they can't do maths. So he said to me, aim for an average score of 70%. If it's 70% is the average score that most of the kids in your class will come away thinking, yes, they can do math, maths, they're competent. And the most important part is that 30% where they make mistakes. That's where I get feedback. The teacher learns. I thought I'd explain that, but they hadn't understood it. So when they make mistakes, it's not to feel guilty about. It's how their teacher can know where to emphasize the lesson, the next few lessons, so that what I thought they had understood, and I, they, they proved they hadn't, I can address in the next lessons. When you make a mistake, it's understanding that there's a point to those mistakes, it's where you can learn to do better next time. So all mistakes is, uh, is where we learn how to do better next time. If you don't make any mistakes, there's nothing to learn. So mistakes are about learning. You acknowledge, forgive, and then you learn. In your book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, you mentioned the first stage is present moment awareness. Can you elaborate and give some practical guide how to train in this first stage of present moment awareness? I'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> in, the, in another moment, another day. Present moment awareness. Okay, yeah, I've got time for this. This is one thing which I told somebody during the interviews. I think should share it with everybody here. And it'll exercise so you can understand what is present moment awareness and you can enjoy it. When you start meditating or any time, you close your eyes and you do some imagination exercises. Imagine that you've been shopping, maybe for Christmas or maybe you've you know, just gone shopping anyway and you're carrying two heavy shopping bags. And a shopping bag in your left hand has got four letters on the outside. P-A-S-T. That's not the name of a shop, but that is signifying what you've got stuffed in that left shopping bag is all your memories of the past, good and bad. There's so many in there that that bag is heavy, it weighs a ton. And you look on the shopping bag in your right hand, and that's got some other letters in it. F-U-T-U-R-E. That's your future. All your worries, concerns, plans, fears. And that shopping bag is packed with all those thoughts of the future. And that makes your arm ache, your shoulder hurts. So once you can feel the weight of these two bags, one in your left hand the past, one in your right hand the future, you imagine leaning your body to the left. So you can lower that bag in your left hand to the floor. And when it, once it reaches the ground, you notice that all the weight vanishes. The burden is gone. And that allows you to unclench your fist, move your hand away from that bag, and relax your left arm and your shoulder. And then you do the same with the bag in your right hand, the future. You lean to the right, and you learn how to lower that bag slowly to the ground. When it meets the floor, there's no weight. That means you can unclench your fist, move your right arm up, and restore the comfort, the peace, the strength in your right arm. And the next thing which you do, you've let go of the past and the future back, you look down there, right next to your feet. No one will take them away, they're safe. And you are standing in this magic place 
between those two bags, right between the past and the future. And that's light and free. That's called the present moment. When you do that as an imaginary exercise, it's much easier. You know what you're doing. You can pick up those bags later. It's not really abandoning them, them totally. But at least you feel what it's like to not be carrying the past and the future all the time. No wonder people get stressed out. The last question. <sighs> Can Ajahn explain about meditation and Apanasati that I knowingly practice Samatha achieving something? Or jhana, then investigate, contemplate four elements, body. The final is to contemplate anicca, dukkha, anatta. Please advise. Okay. If you are going to get insights, I use the, because I was a theoretical physicist before, but I still had to do some experimental physics as well. How do you get new ideas in science? You do the experiments, you need the data. You also need a clear mind to be able to understand that data. So just doing, doing Satipatthana is not enough, simply because you may be mindful, but mindful of what? And is that mindfulness powerful? If you do the jhanas, that's not enough. You may have a powerful mind, when you emerge from jhanas, free from five hindrances, and you have some new data, experience of your mind, what it actually is, that's not enough. You also need the other factors of the Eightfold Path. That's why it has to be the complete Eightfold Path. One of those is uh, the right view. And in that right view, you're told that the Buddha taught about anicca, dukkha, anatta. What does that mean? What is anicca? You think you know, but you don't. When I started studying Pali, I started studying because the not many monks, Western monks, understood the Vinaya, the rules which monks have. And I put myself down to understand that Vinaya for that, so I could help others. And like Pali language is so close to Latin. I studied Latin at school even though it's a real pain to study Latin, on the desk in my Latin class, somebody just scrawled on the Latin class desk, Latin is a language as dead as dead could be. First it killed the Romans, now it's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> and Pali is so similar, but anyway, I, I survived. I wasn't dead after learning Latin. So it made it easy to be able to read the Vinaya and the Suttas in Pali. Anicca, what does that mean? Well, Anicca means they use it in the Vinaya. The opposite, Nietzsche. They have Nietzsche food. That is when somebody comes to the monastery or temple, say every Sunday, and you know they're going to come on Sunday. They come every week on that day to offer food to the monks. That is called Nietzsche food. They may come every Tuesday or once a month or something. Regular supply of food to monks. Anicca does not mean rise and fall. It means irregular. Something which was always coming on one day or always there has now disappeared. It's more than just rise and fall. Rise and fall may be watching a TV and seeing the different programs come and go. Real anicca is when the whole TV set vanishes. And that's not covered in the warranty. That's real anicca. Something always there is no longer there. Your body, five senses, in jhanas, they're not there anymore. That's anicca. Anatta, 
I like the word anatta because in it's no, no atta. What does atta mean anyway? It means a permanent, solid entity inside of you. It is so similar to another English word called atom. Atom is from the Greek, another Indo-European language. Atom means indivisible in Greek, a fundamental part of stuff. And you, I said this in the conference over in Singapore, in about how long ago now? Maybe, well, maybe almost 100 years now, the great New Zealand scientist Rutherford split the indivisible, the atom, and proved the idea of having a fundamental thing from which all matter is made was wrong. But 2,500 years before him, the Buddha split the atoma, the sense of self as an indivisible fundamental particle of you. Anatta is like a stream of consciousness, it may look the same, but it changes, it's totally different, and one day can totally vanish. And dukkha, you all know what dukkha is, don't you? Dukkha is me talking too much and it gets past 10 o'clock and when I should have stopped. <laughs> so I'll end your dukkha by finishing up today. Thank you for all the questions. If one of the questions I didn't ask, answer properly, I do ask your forgiveness, but I did try my best. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.